disqualify anybody no but i'm saying that is when music was music billy oh. Eckstein. oh we miss that i know they call me old school well i raise my hand to old school i want to be old school because that was real music billy epstein you know i i heard some of his recordings uh, um my former co-worker oh she took a billy epstein cd from, you know, she, you know, she borrowed it, and she went down south. She heard her husband. They went down south just listening to Billy Epstein Billy. and loving it. Oh, we miss him so much. And, and you know, talk about the way he dressed. Those men were gentlemen. Oh, yes. I know I saw Epstein in an interview, and they asked him, how do you feel about the way the young people are dressing today? What did he say? He couldn't even speak. Tears came to his eyes. He was speechless because that hurts him that they don't honor the music and the venue as they should. They don't understand what those musicians went through. You know, the only place they had was the was some, some case the Apollo Theater or whatever club that took them. That's right. That's right. Even some of the places they went to, black people couldn't come in to see them. You know, you don't have to go too far in New York, remember? And, you know, like they, they couldn't play really play downtown in a way. Even the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was in Harlem, but when it first came, they could only go there and perform. They couldn't actually, they couldn't actually go in and be seated and watch a show, could they? No, they couldn't go there and perform like it was in many other places. How did you consider your reception here today? Oh, it was very warm and welcoming. I think some of the readers misunderstood initially. They thought the that loyalty was about women. But it, it included them. It just talks about the significance of words and how it's important what you say and how it comes to be. It includes Brooklyn because my words of, I'm going to meet him. And you met him and, too. And I met him, and that tells you the journey from meeting him. That was my journey. I am a loyal fan. I love Brooklyn. And everybody knows. You know, we were talking inside, and I was telling him about, well, in the case of uh, of Elvis Presley, where when, when he passed away, nobody at the Nassau, no one didn't run to the Canasso Coliseum to cash in their ticket. And they held them tickets on for five years. Five years. Five years, they held them the tickets for five years. Amazing. Oh, and the only way they got back, got it back, got their money back as well. Carl McCall, the controller at that time, said that he would give them back their money. Only thing they had to do was show the ticket stuff, and he gave them a peanut butter and banana sandwich. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. And, 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 that's, that's the power of Elvis Presley. I, I, I salute you, what you're doing. Oh, thank you. And you say he's coming up with another book, Patchwork? Patchwork, yes, I have Patchwork coming up. It's, it's stories about families and how they help each other in mending their life challenges. And the, the, the quilt, which is the patchwork, it's the focal point, but we're patching the lives of families in the process of making, bedding. It, it's, it covers a span of about 20 years, and it, it you know, helps generations of families. You know, we didn't mention this inside, but we're going to let it let the cat out the bag. 
You're quite a fisherman. Quite a fisher fisher. Oh yes, I am I'm a fisherwoman. I I, I, fish. I fish very often as often as I can. I'm a angler, they call us. I mean you caught the, I mean those fish Oh boy, you know I, I got in trouble because I said I said I had I'm not supposed to be eating. Had that fried fish up there. Oh <laughs> Lord, it was good. Uh, well, I do enjoy fishing. It's very relaxing for me. Probably not very good for the fish because I always catch a lot of them. But I, I do enjoy fishing. Yeah. I thank you so much, and you thank me. I thank you, Mr. Rafferty. You're welcome. Yeah, You're I like welcome. the spirit. You're welcome. From Sisters Uptown Book Store and Cultural Center, this is a book signing I'll never forget. <laughs> Carol Wilson Mack, thank you so much. And this is Lenny B. from Sisters for the LMS like Extra Extra Show. See you soon. <laughs> Play, that, that one was good. Uh, you introduced me to that, in fact. Yes. He was a very easygoing man. He was I'm deeply sorry. spiritual, even before he became a minister. When I write the one that's about him, you're going to yes. learn a lot about him. Good. Because this is not really about him. It's about my loyalty to someone that I you. just admire. There's a lot of other singers that I like, too. But this one was very special. It's like everything that I've ever done in my life was connected to him. Wow. Do you know, I have classmates who, they didn't like to study, but I love to study. And I would play Brook Benton's music. A lot of them had never heard of him, and I introduced a lot of them to him. Mm -hmm. And one of the ladies, she left school, and I never liked to warn my LPs, but she had one of my LPs, and she left with the LP, and I forgot this, this was a chapter I could have included in the book. She left school with the LP, and you know, a broken LP at a time when I don't have a lot of money, I'm in school, I'm scrambling. That was so special to me, and I wanted that album. I was in such stress because I didn't have it. And I dreamed of Brooke Benton. And I said, why am I dreaming? And this is, is um, after his death. And I'm saying, he said in the dream to me, 
crazy horse was a crazy horse or something like that. And I'm saying we always talked about books and spiritual things, we never about horses. But I was at my sister's house and I said, I'm going to go to OTV and if I see a horse named Crazy Horse, I will bet everything on it. Do you know I went to this, uh, I went to this 125th Street. Yeah. When I walked into the store, the OTV store, they were smoking so bad I couldn't even stay in. So I staggered out of the store. And when I staggered out of the store, it was a man selling albums, and there was that album that that girl took when she left school. So I was able to replace my album. And I ran over to it, and the man picked up that one, and he said, this one, the long-awaited date of Brooks Apparent has arrived. I can hardly contain myself. Excitement exudes from me. It spills over to others, even to those who try to avoid me. I arrive at the Apollo Theater ahead of time. I have never seen such large, large crowds of people. I join the crowd. I am pushed and literally shoved, but I don't get upset because I'm going to see Mr. Rupert. Nothing prepared me for what happened next. No more room, the robust officer shouted at me. I can fit. I said to the officer, I know I could fit into the Apollo Theater, even if it was filled. At the time, I'm only five, three, three and a half inches, and I weigh exactly 97 pounds. There was no room for me, I said with doubt and almost tearfully. No time for tears, I thought to myself. It's time for action. There was room for me, I decided. I was next in line and had eagerly waited for this moment from the first time I heard the man sing. Oh yes, there is room for me, I affirm, I affirm to myself. No more room, no more room for anyone. You heard me, the security officer said as he waved the crowd to wait. No room for me, I questioned. This can't be so, I thought. No more room for anyone, he bellowed. Oh, yes, there is, I challenged him. <laughs> he was approximately six feet tall and about 240 pounds. Yet, as I faced him, all I knew was that I had to get in to see Brooke Benton. The officer sensed an intensity in my voice which reflected my desire, and he may have anticipated minor resistance. Well, this definition, I believe, of me, his definition, I believe, of me, was here is a mere less than a hundred pound groupie. He sees groupies on a daily basis. Each entertainer has his own cast of groupies, is along the lines of what he may have been thinking. The one that stands before me is for Brooke Benton. There were extremely large crowds in front, alongside, and behind me, all waiting to get into the theater. I had not been, seen anything like this in my entire life. I did not know how, but I knew that I had to get in. It was nothing else but to hold on to my sanity. I had to get in. I could not bear the thought of Mr. Brooke Benton being in there. I'm this close, and I cannot see him. The thought of that gave me ability to make a daring decision. I am going to see Brooke Benton, I said to the officer. The officer then realized that getting rid of me was not as easy as he thought. <laughs> he looked piercingly at me, folded his big burly arms across his chest, and spread his legs in a most affirm affirmative stance. He thought that he had created a one-man barricade, more than enough to keep out this little person. When he spread his legs, I quickly realized this was my opportunity. I quickly ducked down into my sprinting position and I ran right between his legs. <laughs> <laughs> and he was shocked. <laughs> and I went in and I saw Brooke Ben. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you should do the audio. You know? <laughs>